Dr. Tamara Soma, an assistant professor at the uh, School of Resources and Environmental Management Planning Program at Simon Fraser University and research director of the Food Systems Lab. Originally hailing from Indonesia, she conducts research on issues pertaining to food loss and waste, abbreviated as FLW, food system planning, food access, and the circular food economy. Dr. Soma is a co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Food Waste and co-founder of the International Food Loss and Food Waste Studies Group, a global network of FLW researchers and practitioners. Dr. Soma was selected as a committee member of the U.S. National Academies of Science and co-authored the Consensus Study, a National Strategy to Reduce Consumer Food Waste. In 2021, the Food Systems Lab was recognized as one of the four women-run projects that are redefining agriculture. And this was uh, recognized by the Canadian Organic Grower. She was also named in Chatelaine Magazine as one of the 10 inspiring Canadian women saving the environment and a Style Canada 30 changemakers. She is a registered professional planner and a proud mother of three. So walk over to you, Dr. Soma. Wonderful, thank you so much <laughs> for that introduction. Hello everyone, um, wonderful. I'm gonna just go ahead and start. Um, greetings of peace, love and good health to all my relations. I'm calling in from the unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And I'm so honored to be speaking with wonderful speakers here today. And my presentation asks, growth for whom? Okay. So um, on the agenda today, I will reflect on the paradoxes of our food system, share some findings from a study on food loss in Southwest British Columbia, and highlight both challenges and solutions that I believe um, are highly relevant to the theme of the panel today on economic injustice. Now, there's a mirror in front of you. Um, and I was always taught to remember, and I was always taught to reflect and turn inwards. Because if we don't reflect on our practices and our policies, and most importantly, on our worldviews, how can we change things for the better? Now, most recently, I don't know if you've heard it, but European Union foreign policy chief, Joseph Burrell argue in his infamous garden versus jungle speech, with, which I think is relevant at this farm conference. He argued that Europe is a garden. We have built a garden, everything works. It is the best combination of political freedom, economic prosperity and social cohesion that humankind has been able to build. And most of the world, most of the rest of the world, he said, is a jungle and the jungle could invade the garden. The gardener should take care of it, but they will not protect the garden by building walls. A nice small garden surrounded by high walls in order to prevent the jungle from coming in is not going to be a solution because the jungle, he argues, has strong growth capacity and the wall will never be high enough in order to protect the garden. And the gardeners have to go to the jungle. Europeans have to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. Otherwise, the rest of the world will invade us by different ways and means. And this is his speech. Now, for those of us, myself included, coming from Indonesia, who have been invaded by the garden, colonized by the garden, resources extracted by the garden, who have somehow, suddenly, we are now categorized as lawless inhabitants of the jungle. It is not a surprise to see how under this worldview, economic injustice continues. And since we're going to be talking about food loss and waste today, I want to share uh, with you this quote by Dr. Mohsin Mustafafi, who is a professor at Harvard Graduate School of Design. He wrote, if we don't see the garbage of our culture, both literally and metaphorically, then we are not confronting the reality of what that garbage actually says about us. And so when we see the facade and the veneer of civilization and modernity and high-tech farming and that so-called garden that Burrell was talking about, this facade is unfortunately hiding a darker story of resource exploitation, pollution, and ecological pillaging. And apologies if this might come across a bit rude, but I would argue that the garden versus the jungle worldview is a garbage worldview. 
Sorry if that's a bit rude. But there's actually a theory to explain this phenomenon of wastefulness and this theory um, or conceptual framework is called distancing. So according to Princeton, the process of distancing is the separation between primary resource extraction decisions and ultimate consumption decisions. So if we look at it from a food angle, according to Dr. Jennifer Clapp, who spoke at this conference um, a, few, uh, a, day, a few days ago, distancing is the separation between the source of our food or the point of production, whether it be farm or what have you, and our plate or the point of consumption. And the result of distancing is overuse, natural resource exploitation, and wastage. And this literal spatial distancing also results or influences mental or spiritual distancing. So if we think about it from an everyday experience, many people don't fully have a grasp of the effort it takes to grow food or harvest food. And this disconnect results in a system whereby many of us may be complicit in supporting highly exploitative and wasteful practices. And it also makes us mentally distanced from the suffering of those who labor in the food system. In a nutshell, as indigenous authors Clarkson, Morissette, and Regalette argue, when we begin to separate ourselves from that which sustains us, we immediately open up the possibility of losing understanding of our responsibility and our kinship to the earth. And this distancing, um, sorry about that, and this distancing um, is reflected in a food system that is full of paradoxes when perfectly edible food is dumped, smashed, and plowed while people have issues accessing food and basic needs. Distancing also means that our hearts are disconnected and detached from our siblings that toil in the field to put food on our table. In the dominant food system, even humans are simply mere commodities. And because we currently still accept a two-tiered food system, a system whereby one class of society gets to choose and access food with dignity while others don't, we continue to offer band-aid solutions like food banking or sending unwanted foods to the poor or philanthropic capitalism a la Bezos or Bill Gates. And we have been complacent to accept that some of us will have choices and others won't. And so we often hear food activists and anti-poverty um, scholars say to those working in food waste reduction initiatives, do not conflate the issue of food waste and food insecurity. Because if we use that logic and conflate the two, then the idea is that we can always feed the poor with what others, you know, whether it be companies, supermarkets, or even farms would otherwise waste. So then why do we even bother preventing food loss at the source if more surplus and if more food waste, quote unquote, means more people can be fed? And while I agree with the underlying sentiment that simplifying the problem of addressing food waste and food insecurity by conflating the two is problematic, completely divorcing those two issues are also problematic. And that is because the food system is interconnected and embedded in the same economic system. Injustice upstream impacts injustice downstream. So I urge all of us to look at all of these issues from a systems angle, and I would argue especially a rights to food approach. Dr. Olivier de Schutter, the special reporter on the right to food asks, how might food systems be reformed to ensure a fuller realization of the right to food? And as you can see, Food system transformation is needed from farm to table to international trade and beyond. And this means looking at a whole systems approach and not necessarily conflating issues, but rather understanding that the issues of food waste and food insecurity is interconnected and embedded in an unjust GDP focused, debt based, and usurious economic system. And as many of you may have known, Canada has been a signatory to the International Covenant on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights back in 1976. And within this covenant, Canada has a legal obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to food. And the right to food is the right of every individual alone or in community with others to have the physical and economic access at all times to sufficient, adequate, culturally acceptable food that is produced and consumed sustainably, sustainably, preserving access to food for future generations. 
And this can be secured through income or social transfers or by producing their own food. Uh, but most importantly, this right to food includes consideration for sustainability and simply a system that wastes so much is not sustainable. So as a food waste scholar, I agree with Dr. Susa Gill when she said that the solutions to the food waste problem limited to techno optimism or technological innovations and only a few sites or even a few countries will prove insufficient and will likely exacerbate existing inequalities. And this is an acknowledgement that simplistic interventions may actually make the problem worse or just move the problem around for others to handle as externalities. So let's get to the study. And the study is how is the current food loss issue in BC connected to the right to food issue? And how do we better understand the role of power and economic growth as this driver to waste? Now, there are two terms commonly used, by the way, and I might use it interchangeably. It's either food loss or food waste. And food loss is basically wasted food that occurs from the point of production, distribution, processing, but not including retail. And food waste usually ties to uh, food that is wasted from the retail sector all the way to the consumer and beyond. So today we're going to talk specifically about food loss. And globally, according to the FAO, 14% of the world's food is lost before the retail level. In Canada, food loss and waste amounts to $49 billion a year uh, in economic value. And in Canada, 22% of food is lost, um, which is an estimated $2.88 billion annually. And this is just a very modest estimate. And the reason why this issue is not very much studied in the global north and in Canada in particular is because there's an assumption that food loss is an issue that happens in the global south because they have not modernized enough, because they don't have enough infrastructure or expertise or knowledge. But those working in the farm in Canada and also scholars in food loss know that food loss is indeed an issue in Canada as well. And so for our study at the Food Systems Lab at SFU, we chose the Southwest region of British Columbia as it has some of the most productive farmlands. It is also home to the Agricultural Land Reserve, which protects um, prime agricultural farmland from urban development. And also because Southwest BC produces over, uh, you know, hundreds of types of agricultural uh, foods. And this one, the one gap I believe in the right to food narrative in Canada is that the poverty reduction debate has focused uh, and centered mostly on consumers and the implementation of a universal basic income for consumers, but there's not much in terms of a right to food approach that addresses the production side or farmers. And I would argue that poverty reduction initiatives also needs to support many small and medium farmers who are struggling to make ends meet, even while they are trying to grow food to feed us. So we know some of the stats. Average age of farmers, 55. 40% of farm family income in Canada is achieved through off-farm activities, so not just through farming alone. According to Statistics Canada, Canadian farmers have over $100 billion in debt, and farmers are also facing soaring farming costs. And on average, Canadian farmers pay $3.1 billion per year in interest alone, in interest alone. And this is the toxicity of an interest-based usurious economic system. It ensures perpetual slavery because that is how infinite growth for the banks happen. The banks don't have to do work and there's no risk on their part. They just reap the interest as guaranteed profit from an unpayable debt because it's just simply too much. There's not one farmer I know in the world that ever has a guaranteed profit. So if you are serious about tackling unequal economic growth, you need, we need to really address this issue of interest, AKA user, usury, and forgive the debt and distribute the wealth. It will, be, it will never be in the interest of wealthy, the wealthy people to distribute wealth when by simply letting the money sit, it just accumulates interest. And interestingly, <laughs> I'm saying interest a lot, most major faith traditions in the world are actually against the practice of usury, but in fact, it is the primary means today of capital accumulation. So moving on, um, our findings will highlight the role of power and the structures that are beyond the individual farmer's control, uh, the role of commoditiz commoditization, and we'll explore how a right to food approach can help design waste out of the system. 
So in this study, we interviewed um, many, many people, 40 participants, most of them farmers. We interviewed policymakers, and we were focused more on the fruit and vegetable sector. And some of the key findings on the reasons for the loss of edible food at the farm are very much tied to unequal power relations. And I'm just going to highlight three because of time limitations. And the three are overproduction as a buffer against risk and power imbalance, stringent aesthetic standards and expectation across the food supply chain. And we're going to talk about like who is pushing that um, and also in environmental and labor issues. And so if we were to answer what role does power play in denying people the right to an equitable and sustainable food system, you will find some very, very powerful players. And one of the major powerful players is the retail sector, particularly large retailers. So in the European Union, unfair trading practices or UTP by retailers, such as short notice cancellation, unilateral contract changes by purchasers, these practices have been identified as responsible for driving and creating food loss. And unfair trading practices, which occurs due to power imbalance among actors, is particularly prevalent because the market concentration of a handful of large retailers allow for that power imbalance. Um, and in fact, this is true in the case of Canada, where only five grocery stores um, companies command 80% of the food retail market. And so here are some examples we found in our study. So one farm association noted the issue of having their food being rejected once it arrives at the supermarket. So this person noted, if I load it into a truck, it gets delivered to the supermarket and the supermarket rejects it and sends it back. Now I have to pay the truck no matter what, because the truck did what they were going to do. I can't say, well, you know, they didn't like the product, so I'm not going to pay you. Now the product comes back and it sits here and it costs us money to pull stuff and store stuff here. And then we have to pay. So even if I find a home for it, we have to pay the freight to get it here again. And it's all diminishing return to the grower and it's reducing the value of the product. And next, we're going to tackle about the role of commoditization and how it plays in the devaluation of food and the right to equitable labor. And so currently, there is this powerful regime that is based on industrialization and commoditization, which promotes a monoculture system as the dominant farming approach. And one farmer noted that prior to this heavy emphasis on monoculture, uh, food that could not be sold can be integrated quite seamlessly within the farm, and it can help strengthen and diversify farm income rather than them having to go around buying specialized animal feed and all of these things, but it's increasingly harder to do. And increasingly, prices are so driven to the, uh, to the ground, and this is the real cost of cheap food, um, which is a book by Dr. Michael Carolyn, ties to that, is that even well-intentioned efforts from the farmer side to redistribute food for free can create a backlash. An example of this is gleaning where one farmer um, found that in allowing the public to glean, other farmers who were distressed because of the, the, the prices just driven to the ground were very, very upset at this farmer. So basically there is this disincentive to drive, dropping prices even further or donating too much and creating more abundance because it just furthers decreases the price and therefore the ability of farmers to make ends meet. And if you remember, there's also the commoditization of human labor. And growers that we interviewed repeatedly noted that they face constraints around finding sufficient skilled labor during the growing season. And this is due to our dependence on precarious migrant farm laborers, which is also connected to the high cost of agriculture and farmers finding it struggle challenging to make ends meet. Weather disruptions is also an issue. And this is currently, there is currently no program and no financial support that would allow workers to have permanent residency and stay all year long and have stability. And so as you can see, all of the reasons I mentioned and many more result in edible food that was intended for human consumption being wasted. And sometimes for the farmers we interviewed, their only sense of relief is that at the very least, it serves as soil amendment. And so, there's all these different solutions right now to tackle this issue from food donation through gleaning through ugly fruits and vegetables. So why, why, do, why have we not solved the problem? And so what we found is that there are actually many barriers to implementing solutions and this results in farmers continuing to leave their produce on the field. 
And out of all of the farmers that we interviewed, the vast majority did not use the food donation tax credit because it is complex and it is not their interest to prove that they have more loss because you they already have uh, you're not taxed on a loss as this one person said then there's the market-based solution of selling ugly fruits and vegetables but then when the retailers did try the consumers didn't buy it and then so that increased shrink uh, for the retailers and when the farmers do have extra and they try to donate charities have limitations and they do not always have the infrastructure to accept the food so then there is little uptake right so all of these solutions have challenges and so when we ask farmers, what do you really need? How can we actually find solutions that can create the environment that you need to make sure that farming works, food loss is prevented, and the right to food approach is, um, is uh, promoted? And so these are some of the solutions that farmers propose. And I will talk about two of the key solutions because I'm running out of time. So the first one is a right to food, uh, right to food approach. And this farmer mentioned how important it is not to just have farmers rewarded for their efforts and pay the living wage, but also for the farm workers and the people across the food se sector feeding us, often working lower than the minimum wage. Second of all, and this is part of a study that is ongoing and that I'm very excited about is the focus on a universal school meal program and farm to school. And so farmers that we talked to said that it is important to try to address stability and create alternative food procurement strategies and farm to school or school food meal program is an opportunity for farmers not to rely so much on the five big retailers. And so here I have a call uh, to action for all of us in this conference. One in five Canadian children go to school hungry, and currently the federal government is consulting on a national school food policy and program. And several of the questions asked actually wanted people wanted to understand if whether or not local and sustainable food would be important for school meals. So I highly encourage everyone is in this conference to share what they think. And I've actually asked the organizers to share the link of the consultation, because if universal school meals just mean buying more from multinational corporations, this will not result in the transformation that we hope to see. And so to conclude, here are a few recommendations on how we can fight for the right to food to achieve a sustainable closed loop food system that prevents and reduces waste and increase food access to people. And, and I will, the slides will be available and the recording will be available. And now I'm one minute over time. And so I will just end it with saying that I'm very grateful to be here. And if there are any questions and you need any resources, I'm available um, in this email and this Twitter account and also this this is the Food Systems Lab website. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Tamara.